Good evening. Welcome to another edition of Sacred Expression. My name is Basir Mchawi. And this evening, we're going to be having a conversation with Anthony Sloan. Anthony Sloan, a world traveler. And he's been doing a lot of things while he's been back here in North America. Mm-hmm. But Anthony, what's happening? Well, there's a lot happening in the world. <laughs> there's a lot happening back here. I, I, I insist. Now, here's the thing. Here's the interesting thing, for sure. I insist that we're actually in a almost like a, a, a real, a real a authentic pre-revolutionary time. And it has to do with the economics. Hmm. That's what I insist, but I'll, I'll stop it right there. Hmm. No, let me, let, me, let, me, let me stop right there. What I learned in South Africa, especially, because the young people, especially, they understand it. They say, look, the struggle, and it's the same thing here, the struggle that they won was a struggle for a political and social whatever, uh, 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 equality, acceptance, whatever have you. Isn't that the same thing we got here? We only got the political and the social. What was missing is the economics. No question. And that's, what, and that's what's going to change. I mean, if, that's you rem- if you remember, that's probably one of the reasons why, uh, you know, Dr. King was assassinated, because he was talking about that ultimately the issue that we were going to have to contend with was an economic one which is why he started the Poor People's Campaign and all these other things. And of course, it was at that particular point that he was assassinated. But let's go back for a minute. Zip. And why don't you talk a little bit, give uh, some of the audience an idea about some of your background. You know, like, who are you? Where are you from? What's happening? How how do we arrive here at this space in 2019? Oh, my goodness. You know, <laughs> one of my favorite writers is Richard Wright. You know, he has this, he has this, uh, I think it's in his book, The Long Dream, which I think should be taught in every, you know, it's a coming age story for black black teenagers or whatever happened. I think that should be taught instead of Invisible Man, or whatever, not Invisible Man, but instead of the Native Son, because this is an incredible book. Uh, anyway, in that book, one of, the, one of the lines is like, I'm just a pimple on the pole of progress. <laughs> so that's well, but it's, I'm an insignificant little speck in the face of the earth. But hold on, I know you're gonna say, "Well, don't worry. No, the thing is, I think there's a lot of us insignificant little specks that have, that will come together and we make a mass, and that's that, and that's what's happening. I'm just I'm just a, a part of a of a, of a, of a mass. Mm-hmm. Um, um, my mass started, I guess my my speck started in the South Bronx in New York City. In the, in the time when we when we didn't have a double school or whatever, triple schedules or whatever have you. Uh, you know, I was at the, the William Lloyd Garrison School, uh, PS31. That's up there on, uh, on, uh, on the concourse, beginning of the concourse, you know. Um, Patterson Projects, right there, up in the Patterson Projects. So they bust you from Patterson over to uh, Garrison? No, no, no. The, the William Lloyd Garrison is the public school. It's, uh, elementary, we just walked up the hill. Kind of walk up the hill, okay. You know, because it was PS18 was where most of the project is. That's the that's some they did something weird, but we walked up the hill. That's why the Bronx is cool because we got hills. You know, uh-huh. you know. as, as people are finding out in terms of this movie, The Joker, where oh. they have this like, that, that big the, stairway. As soon as I said that, I said that's the West Bronx. I know yeah, what it is. I know what it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that movie, by the way. I haven't seen it. Oh man, you should see that movie. It's an amazing movie. But don't think Louis is a joke. It's, it's a movie about the downtrodden. That's that's all you have to know. We got you. Um, but um, and then uh, then I went right there to a uh, larger uh, uh, clock. Uh, Roger D. Clark Junior High School 149, which is right there, right across from Patterson Projects. Um, and then, now, uh, I did get bust, though, when I went to high school. Okay. Because I was supposed, our, our, mag, our school in that area is supposed to be Morris, a little bit up, you know. Mm-hmm. But um, I went through this whole, they identified us in like fourth grade, something like that. Anyway, I went and uh, I was part of a thing called College Discovery, which is the precursor to the, to the SEEK program. I guess okay. you all know the SEEK program. And so I was one of those exp- experimental rats that they started in third, fourth grade. We could have some reading comprehension. And so anyway, when I got out of junior high school, they said, hey, no, you took the test for conference. Yeah, you passed. Fine. And, and you're supposed to go to Mars. But nah, we're going to bust you up to Fordham Road. <laughs> so what? <laughs> Fordham Road. But you see, I was a kid that, that I didn't care. You know what I mean? I'm so what, they put you at Roosevelt? Yeah, Theodore mm-hmm. Roosevelt High School, right across from Fordham, 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 Fordham University. University. Mm-hmm. Right down from White Castle. Yeah. Sorry, I had to mention White Castle. Well, listen, you see, I know. When you said Fordham Road, I know where you were going to high school, right? You know, so I either, Bronx I, could, side. Yeah, either I could take the 41 bus or take the L. The L was still running mm-hmm. up there. Third Avenue, huh? Yeah. So, People don't even know. I mean, listen, that's, <laughs> that's ancient history for so many people. about ancient history. Let me say something. <laughs> it was remarkable about my, my high school. We had a swimming pool in the school. Mm-hmm. Now, you didn't have, I don't think you had that in Mars, but we had a swimming pool in the school, mm-hmm. an Olympic-sized swimming pool. Whoa. It was interesting. So I had a good childhood um, after my little uh, thing with, with, with uh, foster care, you know, 
terribly abused there, but they, they survived that. My grandmother took us in, Patterson Projects, you know, Adam Clayton Powell Jr. got us in the Patterson Projects. Mm -hmm. and, um, and somehow I ended up with the Cadet Corps, New York City Mission Society, Cadet Corps. That was a really a good experience for me growing up like that. And we don't know, it's weird because I was just talking about this before. In my childhood, I know we had everything. You know, um, we had a thing called a floating hospital where three times a week in the summertime, you know, we go out and get medical checks and, and, and dental and, and I think, uh, glasses. But but also, you had the kids all playing together. It was a really interesting thing. And then Cadet Corps provided a whole lot of things. I mean, like fencing and you know, the ice skating. I mean, you know, every, every we had winter camp, summer camp. It was you know, menacing was a camp. Yeah, I think people don't understand, you know, that, uh, you know, despite there was poverty, that people were not poor. You know, quite different than today where, you know, people are living in... Uh, I guess environments that are, are, are really, really devoid of any kind of anything. Whereas we could be poor and be in a very culturally rich, educationally rich environment. Well, you know, the things change really. Look, I, I, I attribute it to actually, uh, I know it's kind of we started with somewhat economics. We started with, the, uh, taking, with Nixon taking us off the gold standard. I mean, that's 1971. I think that was somewhere from the 70s, from the early 70s to the late 70s. That's when things started to change, because then the rich people started to prey more on the on the, on the poor people. When I say prey, I mean P R E Y on the poor people. I think that's what really changed it, because that's when you had P R A Y too, right? <laughs> well, well, I don't want to get into that, that part. But, you know, because when Rockefeller wrote that little law on the napkin or whatever he did and, and, and set that into, in, into motion, you know. Where, Rockefeller drug law. Yeah. And because the trick was this, and I, I swear, I see this myself. You, they, basically, the, the the drug dealers, you know, they said, oh, OK, well, they, they say 16. Let me let me get a 16 year old pusher. I mean, so if he gets busted, he got pff, nothing, nothing to it. Right. Mm -hmm. So now you have a 16 year old. And a 16-year-old is trying to sell drugs to, say, a 30-year-old who has been a hook for 15 years, whatever, 10 years, whatever it is. So a 30-year-old, 32-year-old says, get out of here, sex the drugs. So now the drug dealer says, ah, next time that happens, here, take this, take this gun, you know, bust him, bust him, in, his, you know, bust him in his behind. And then what, what happens is now, now you have a 16-year-old has a gun. Mm -hmm. 14, his 14-year-old brother is gets some beef at school, and he says, here, disbar this gun. So now you have guns in the hands of 14, 15, 16 year olds who have no idea of mortality or anything like that. And that's when it all went downhill. Not just that, but there's a, it's like a perfect storm. A lot of stuff happened. You, you, from, you, you, you hung out in Brooklyn a lot. There was, I think there was a study that it was in three areas of Brooklyn. Those are the areas that went up, that, that they set up, up uh, you know, set up the crime that went up. To, I mean, there's, there's uh, five area codes around the city. That, that gets about 70% of uh, all of those who are incarcerated upstate. That's right. And they know it. But here's what happened. When they were incarcerated, they started taking away people's belts and, and their shoelaces, whatever. So now their pants are sagging, yeah. right? Now they come back to the neighborhood, people say, oh, that's an interesting fashion. Mm -hmm. So they start sagging their pants. Right, and taking uh, the laces out of your sneakers and things like that, which people were not really aware of. They thought it was just some kind of style. That's but, right. you know, you're referring to the war on drugs, which is essentially the war on black and brown people, because that's, that's right. what it was. We see the difference now. Uh, now that white people are taking opioids, it's a public health crisis. Mm -hmm. And uh, prior, if you were a, a, a drug user, you were a criminal. Now they're decriminalizing the use of opioids, heroin, by white people but because it's, it's white people that are going ahead and using it. It's too late. They commit suicide like, like flies. And know? overdosing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah. anyway. so the state offered them. All I'm trying to say is that, that they were in a dire situation. And the only way to get out of it, the funny thing to, do, to me, the, the way to get out of it is by, is by not, I hate to say this, but I have to say this. We have to stop. Let me put it as delicately as delicately as I can. We have stop. We have to stop listening to the people who gave who give the, the traditional solutions. You know, just stop listening to them. It's as simple as that. Whatever their solution is, stop. Don't do that. I'm not saying do the opposite. Don't do that. Who do you listen to? Not them. <laughs> well, I'm with that. You know? <laughs> Definitely. I'm serious, I'm serious about this. So we got you to high school. Yeah. What's next? Um, uh, interestingly enough, I, I became political really like 13, 14, 15 years as far as just not understanding and stuff like as that. As did we all in terms uh, of uh, our generation. People in the city, you know, back then, we, you know, we, we were listening to Lorraine Hansberry and, and, and uh, James Bowen 
and and Malcolm X. You know, I mean, I don't know who the South was listening to, but that's what we were listening to. You know, so so that. But but also here's the pivotal thing. When I went, when I finally got to, um, I graduated Theodore Roosevelt High School with a general diploma. Before then, they had academic and general diplomas. You got the general. Diploma. I got the general diploma. Because I'm, right. I'm no smarter than anybody else. I'm, I'm an idiot. You know what I mean? As far as these things go. But anyway, uh, uh, but what happened is when I went to, I went to, I had a choice actually because I was called Discovery. I could have went to Lincoln University or Fordham University, as it was. But I chose to go to Bronx Community College. Mm. I don't know why, but I just did. I don't even think I, ch- I don't even think I choose things in my life. It just yeah. happened that way. But at Bronx Community College, and we had these two guys, uh, uh, Bobby and Billy Shepard. Uh, uh, they changed their name. They, 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 they changed their name. They were media. Anyway, uh, they we had a re- uh, literally we had a revolutionary cell. There was three guys, three girls, right. Mm-hmm. And they basically, you know, we were reading Che, we were reading, you know, Nakumba, you know, the, 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 the little red book, little black book, whatever, you know, he's reading, you know, Fanon, the whole, the whole, the whole shot. It's a little revolutionary group. And we, we had a group called Simba. And so we were like the, the brainchild that we would bring the information up to the, to the, to the leaders of Simba, whatever. I mean, they were acting, I suppose. But then all of a sudden, he took over the school. So all us little revolutionaries, we had to now take positions of responsibility. Now my responsibility was the uh, the switchboard. This one had the switchboard to pull up, you know. So I said, look, here's our line. This the Bronx Community College school has been liberated. You cannot speak to anyone. Undo. <laughs> und, undo. And so that's the whole thing. So then from there, then what, what happened was I, I that's when the draft came in. And and see the thing is, but they don't tell you about the draft. If you were in the South Bronx like I was. It didn't matter what your number was because it went by draft. <laughs> it was going anyway. You, you could have been 300 and, 369. You know what I mean? You was going because if you got people in jail, people in response. So mine was 115, something like that. But the thing is, I spoke, I, strangely enough, uh, my, my older brother, who would be out of touch for like 30 years, I just, we, I'm going to see him tomorrow for the first time in like 35 years, something like that. But he, he was a merchant marine. And he said, well, he said, well, Anthony, no. You don't want to go into the army because they're fodder, you know, like that. So you don't want to go into Marines because they have a mission. Their mission is to, you know, to kill them, basically. And then you, you say, now the Marines, they, they say, not the Marines, they, the Air Force, the, um, the, uh, the Navy, you might be on a ship, you know, 25 guys, 25 black guys, and the rest or you know, from the South, you know, like that. So you may want to, because you're pretty smart, you know, take a test for the Air Force. The Air Force. So I took that test for the Air Force and I passed. Unbeknownst to me, though, a whole lot of other people had that same idea. So consequently, in the Air Force, at least between 1970 and 71 that I can speak for, we had some of the smartest people on the planet in the Air Force as enlisted people because the Air Force uh, mission is to keep them flying. Mm. Keep them flying. That's mm. them. If you if you wasn't flying, you was like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I became a lab technician because, interestingly enough, because of the um, because of the riots and stuff like that, or the upheavals, urban upheavals, because the NAACP and the people were insisting that black people get better jobs in the military. So I was supposed to be a flying nurse. They changed me to a lab technician mm. because I had lab techniques in high school. So, so that's what happened. So uh, I became a lab technician. So I did my four years. I wasn't kidding. I was going to get my four years and get out because I was a theater. I started theater in like 67 at the mm-hmm. Ensemble Company. Mm-hmm. So. Where were you deployed? I mean, that's one of the things that you joined the Air Force. You're in the Air Force. It's in the Vietnam years now. The war is going on. It's not yet wound down. You know, of course, many people who were in the Air Force, they got deployed. Well, and whether they went to Europe or whether they went to um, I mean, Japan, Japan or whether they went to Southeast Asia itself, they went somewhere. Yeah, yeah. And then there's different realities everywhere too. Because if you went to Southeast Asia, you have a different mentality than if you say you was, you was stationed in Germany, or even the Philippines. It's a different mentality versus if you never went. There's a yeah. third mentality. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm the third mentality. Okay. You know, so uh, what was it? Zlackland is the is the base for training. And then I went to Shepherd Air Force Base for whatever I did there, um, the, the regular training. Then I had my Phase Two training over at Wright Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. And then they they gave me there was I was stationed in a dispensary at McGuire Air Force, McGuire Air Force Base in New Jersey. Mm. And what was interesting is McGuire is surrounded by by uh, the uh, Fort Dix Hospital, which basically means. We didn't have no duties because we was a dispensary. If some big case came in, they should move to the hospital. Mm-hmm. So I had I lived a charm life. I never left the states. Wow. I, I, my last my last year and a half, 
I went to school part time. I had a part time gig that caused I had all kinds of organizations on base. We had a black caucus. We were doing all kinds of work. In fact, interestingly enough, back then, I'm talking about in '73, we did tests in the community. We gave six free free, free sickle cell tests. We organized it, and also lead poisoning tests. Mm. So people knew about lead. And I, I can say personally, since 1973, people knew about lead poisoning just in the paint and even in the water. I would say. And remember, you got to remember that the uh, Black Panther Party and the Young Lords yes, all sir. did uh, lead paint the testing as well in their communities. That's right. That's what we helped out with. Mm-hmm. And here's the interesting thing, too. When I was at McGuire, it was, it was, it's a MAC command, it's military airlift command. But I saw, that's the first time I saw Saudi Arabia patches. So we've been training the Saudis since the early 70s. Mm-hmm. You know, these kind of things. It's, it's money, bro. Money, money. So anyway, like so that's, 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 that's my thing. Hey. I got out and um, I started doing radio. I was I was uh, because I had this part time job at Princeton Hospital. Uh, I had to spend the weekend over there because I'm, I'm a public transportation guy. I had no car at the time, and there was this uh, radio program. Uh, and in the hospital, you were doing lab technician. Yeah, lab technician. Yes. You were trained now as a lab technician. Yeah, I'm a middle middle class kid. You know, okay. middle, middle class. Now I'm making making pay. I'm, I'm, you know, we don't get the paper as they said. He said. But uh, there's a program called um, uh, Variations. No, that's my program. This thing called uh, Saturday Soul with JB, at from from the Princeton University Station, uh, WPRB. And I listened to it. And they said, "Well, if you have any poetry at the time, I was writing poetry. You have poetry, come down to the, you know, mm-hmm. share with the community." I didn't know nothing about no community radio because I've been listening to RVR, you know, you know, when I was growing up, you know, you know that that, you know, WWRL, you know. I know I'm here. Yeah, WRL and the good guys, you know, WABC. I know nothing about no you know, BAI was on, but I never knew about BAI, nothing like that. So so I, I come down with my poetry, you know, and the guy looked at me and said, Oh, those are those guys from last night. This is a different thing. I didn't know they had different things. So anyway, so I hung up there and I started doing being uh, being his poet in residence. So he had a, he had basically his first time, first time and the last time at Princeton Radio. They had we had a six and a half hour um Saturday Soul, so you know, like like you know, uh, uh, you know, everybody back back then, all all the you know, uh, uh, you know, the Isaac Hayes, you know, and, and all of all the people Music like that, like that, the people know, too, I guess. Soul, Soul Makosa, all of those kind of things like that. So I would do one poem, and and then I just see what he's doing with the boy. Then finally, when 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 that ended, I went to Livingston College, at the part of Rutgers University, it's in the New Brunswick area. Um, that was a very interesting experience because you have to think of I, Livingston College. People should do a program just on Livingston College. Livingston College was like an HBCU in the middle of an Ivy League college. Yeah. It was amazing. I mean, our teachers were like like uh, 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 Tony Morrison, uh, you know, Pepsi Charles, we, we, you know, A.B. Spellman, you know, Larry really did, was was the Chairman of the music department. The classmate of mine was was was, was James Spaulding, graduated my, my class. You know, it was amazing. The mean age for the for the school was like twenty five. Mm. Was an amazing school, and they killed it. <laughs> yeah, well. Anyway, so that, that's that's mine. And one of the things they did, I mean, I guess in terms of part of it is that they really started to try to develop Rutgers Newark. You know, yeah. which uh, probably back in those days when you were there, yeah, I mean, there was no real big Rutgers Newark. Campus. Yeah, but they I, they had it, but you're yeah. right. Because there also was another one someplace else, I forget. Maybe it was Trent. I'm not, no, no, not Trent State. That was Trent State. Um, but yeah, they were doing Rutgers Newark. Yeah. Because the story is actually, uh, Livingston College, they actually went to the to the pool halls to recruit students. Mm-hmm. It was a very interesting experiment. It was very, it was a good school. It was a really good school. Amen. So that's that. So then, um, by the time I got back to to, to the theater, and then I then I went to graduate school for uh, playwriting. I had basic school. I, I didn't take my, my my degree, but by the time I got back here, that, that whole ten year be, period between, like, like say, nineteen seventy and nineteen eighty, by the time I got back to New York, things have changed radically. In theater, there's a lot of cabal, a lot of nepotism, whatever, and I didn't like the scene. And that's when I started to deal with WBAI. And, and, and yeah. the rest of well, you know, you talk about a time when there used to be a lot of community theater back in the sixties. And you had so many people. You had, you know, Amiri Baraka and Ed Bullen's plays, you know, all over the place all the time. You had Woody King really, uh, you know, beginning to develop, you know, his art as a producer, empresario in regards to theater. And there was a lot of stuff because it would just pop out. I mean, when you had, for instance, the uh, the Black Arts 
you know, in Harlem. You know, one of the things they would do is theater in the street, theater yeah. in the park. Yeah. So but, yeah, but we had was, that sense. In the late 60s, because, you know, we had the New Lafayette Theater, mm -hmm. right? Barbara and Terry was just starting up. You had Ellis Stewart down uh, down in the village, you know, uh, Little Mama Cafe. There was a lot of activity. Mm -hmm. You're right. You're absolutely right. I mean, not just, like, just, just alternative. Theater. Yeah, know? alternative theater. I think the things like the Living Theater, all those kind of radical things was happening at the time, you know? It's a radical time. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and one of the things, of course, is that the art should be an expression of the radical nature of those times, which I think a lot of times, uh, you know, people who consider themselves to be, quote, radical, or politically progressive, I think they forget that now. That's why I mentioned, that's why I mentioned the gold standard, because then the, the money was different. You know what I mean? When it, when it hit the 70s, that money thing started to change. Somebody once said there was some sort of formula that you wouldn't pay more than, like, say, a quarter of your salary uh, for your rent. But then it went up, you know, now you don't have you don't have discretionary funds to support anything. Forget the arts, you know. You know, like, so you know I remember when I was, uh, started making ten thousand dollars a year. Mm -hmm. That was a lot of money. <laughs> you could do everything, you know, I, and, and it's really amazing. And and you look at now, you know, people making ten times that are struggling. But it's for, it's because of bankers and their shenanigans. Oh yeah. You know what I mean? We no, hit the Enron thing, and when they get busted for that, then they go and buy off the the the, the, the Congress and make different policies. So what they were busted for, they, it's now legal. It's right, that kind right, of thing. Right, is, right, right. It's not right. And wages have remained stagnant since, uh, you, you know, the 1980s at least. You know, they, they went up a little bit, I can't even say incrementally, from the 70s to the 80s. But now they've, uh, you know, really leveled off. They've been stagnating. Uh, along with that, of course, you know, we've had uh, everything else getting, you know, <laughs> seriously more expensive. I tell people this all the time. I say, look, you know, and you, 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 you loved Obama. I'm so happy you love Obama. That's so wonderful for you. But I defy you to pick up his book like I did, you know, Audacity of Hope, right, and read it now. Read it now knowing what you know. <laughs> and you can see how he betrayed everybody and then made the rich people rich. Rich made rich people richer. Yes, yeah, some 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 neo Negroes got some, a little bit of money, you know. Yeah. But, but 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 the amount of two thousand eight, man. Uh, you know, definitely the bank bailout. That's what it was. They bailed out the banks and did not bail out the people who had actually been manipulated and. Uh, Victimized, I guess we have to say victimized by the banks. They weren't bailed out. It was the banks that were bailed out. Exactly. And here's the thing. Here's what I learned from being in South Africa. Like I said, South Africans know, these are young people I work, they, they know what's going on. And and they, what South Africa did, they purposely built a middle class. They purposely built a middle class to buffer them from, the buffer them from, as they say, the pitchforks or whatever it is. Yeah. You know what I mean? And now this middle class has, has bought into the deal. And so they are, they become your suppression class. You know what I mean? But the South Africa, they're not going for it. Well, that's pretty similar to here because if you look at the children of the civil rights movement, you know, they are that they buffer got, class. They got problems. Yeah, they're, they're the buffer class. I feel sorry for them. Yeah, you know, they got a lot of stuff that they have to contend with. And, and of course, we were talking earlier, you know, one of the interesting things is that uh, the civil rights movement didn't really catch on <laughs> in the urban centers of the north like they did in some of the rural centers in the south. Mm -hmm. You know, so we were listening to the Nation of Islam, Brother Malcolm. Mm -hmm. You know, we were going ahead and looking at other things. You know, we weren't really attracted to the philosophy of nonviolence as uh, espoused by Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., and we were reading too. But I remember I had a job at a place called Charge It. That's the first time they had one of these, the first Kodak, Kodak big machines with the color Kodak big mm. machines, right? I ran one of those, right? Okay. And I remember one time somebody came in and they gave me uh, Elijah Muhammad's book, you know, the, the, his, his, his talk about he, 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 whatever. Oh, the message know, to the black man. Message to the black man. Man, I ran out about 10 copies <laughs> to, to give out to people. <laughs> Things like that we could do, you know? But now people don't read. Uh, yeah, they got the YouTube, so you get some speeches, which is, which is good, I suppose, you know. Um, but things, uh, people, I think people are now just coming to a conscious because they, they're trying to figure out why they why things haven't changed, why things or whatever it is. But it's, it's, I think as this stuff gets more out into, I would say, again, 
See, your revolutionary class, everybody thinks about this revolutionary. Your revolutionary class is actually, this is what I've come to believe in the last few, and that is your 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 upper middle class people. In other words, when they come when they come and try to suppress something, who do they come after? They come after the poets and the professors and the and the journalists. And that's basically your sort of, you know, they're not rich, but you know, that that kind of class people. The poor people are poor, they know they're poor, and they, they're always struggling, right? But this other people that's become comfortable, once these folks figure out, oh, you know something, we've been hoodwinked. You know what I mean? They gave us Barack and his and his, and his family and, and we we went along with that. But but he had did nothing for us and did everything. And these people are now have all that money. They're taking the money they made and and further well, subjugating us. You know what? Uh, you know Marx and Marx is referred to as the petty bourgeoisie. <laughs> yeah, but see, I don't go with that analysis. I really don't because I, I I don't I don't I don't I don't buy it. They're petty because they refuse they refuse to accept that they've been hoodwinked. That's what I would say. Well, I mean, in French, it's petite, meaning the small. I mean, it, it's not like they're petty. In the sense of being petty, I don't think that's where the term comes from. No, but Although I, some people will talk to him. <laughs> I I say petty, just like I just like I, I say petty, P-E-T-T-Y, petty. because they do petty you. things. You know, <laughs> talking bad about me, putting somebody down. How could you put your you know? No, you you, you go to you go to you go to your, your institution, your church institution, and you, you didn't make it a church institution. You know, as James Moore once told me, you know, they 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 go to the old neighborhood and walk over the homeless to get to their church. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. Mm. That's petty. Okay? It is. It is. <laughs> That's petty. Let's move the story forward. Sure. And uh, WBAI. Mm. You come to WBAI. You're involved in theater. Mm. And one of the things you attempt to try to do is see how some of the things you can do in theater translate to radio. Well, this is a very interesting because I came to BAI because I had a, I had a college program called Variations in Blackness. I did it a certain way because when I was at uh, doing a, a Saturday Soul, we created a little group, you know what I mean? So I did Variations in Blackness. Uh, I had, again, a little group of people that I brought in with me, you know? And so when I got to uh, back to New York and I would listen to radio, I would listen to Emanations, the Bernard's program. And his program was closest to what I was doing on my college program. So I went, came to BA, I volunteered one time. And you know, so after the, you know, after, after you do a shift or whatever, the, the guy comes out, you know, I came out and says, oh, thanking everybody. And I, I said, oh, so I introduced myself, oh, Mr. White. But you know, he said, that Mr. White. <laughs> yeah. you know, I, went, went, went. <laughs> I said, well, you know, I have, I have a little radio experience. I think I can, you know, contribute a little bit to your program. I do, I can do Vox Pop. You know, because I, I can edit, whatever. I said, I'll go out and get a little sound. I noticed that you have a, because I've been listening, I noticed you have a, a topic. So I can go out and get pop, you know, the people talking about whatever the topic is, and then we make a little clip, you know, and then maybe put it on your program. So that's a good idea. He said, he said but, but let me ask you, what do you want to do here? It was a very interesting thing, because I'm, you know, he said, what do you want? Well, I said, well, you know, I, I do theater somewhere. I would like to do radio drama. You know, he says, oh, we do radio drama here. Now, here's the question. This is like 82 or something like that. I didn't really start doing audio drama at BAI until like, say, 86, somewhere like that. So what were you doing for four years? This is where, okay, let me say it this way. I know for sure, I know this, this, this doesn't go well with a whole bunch of people. But I'm always thinking, always thinking. I looked at BAI and I'm going like, this is a madhouse. I see, I, I'm going to say, there's a cabal here, a cabal there, a cabal everywhere. You know what I mean? Now with Bernard, when I started, I started just putting the records back in this thing. You know, it was just me and Bernard. And I get him to the spot, you know, and, and, and we play that, and then we go and he interview the guests. And every once in a while, he allowed me to ask a question, like Bogart or something like that. But then the group started to grow. But but that's how I started, just helping Bernard and also volunteering all over the states. But what I started to do, what I did was I sort of ingratiated myself to each faction, if you will. You know, I learned all the engineering of all the different rooms and everything like that. And so uh, basically, whatever the, no matter what the, 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 the group was, I would try to help them out. You know, I, I started training people, you know, make, uh, making coilies and make, encourage people to get their own microphone, get their own headphone. I mean, to this day, I, I go to BBP people at BA, I said, I said, let me ask you something. You've been here how many years and you don't have your own headphones? You come in here and you want BA to give you headphones? Get your own headphone. Oh, you've been here, you're a producer, and you ain't got a, a tape machine? Get your own headphone. I tell them that. But because I've been through BA, the way I've been through BA, I can say things like that. What are they going to do, you know? So anyway, so so about, uh, so what I did was, uh, once once I sort of graciously got everybody going, I had been modeling at the School of Visual Arts, you know, artist modeling. 
and there was a group there called Creative Unity. And uh, and I said, you know, y'all are really good. They were doing all kinds of skits. You know, I said, y'all are really good, but you know, they they're not going to accept you being being uh, you know Mayor Koch or you being Ronald Reagan because you're black. You know what I mean? But if he was on radio, da da da. I said that so we, had, we still had the folio going. I said, well, I tell you what. Let me try to get you a gig at the folio to give you a little bit of money, right? And I'll train you in radio. You can do your stuff, maybe do your stuff on radio. So they came and they got a radio program. We had called Radio Unity Collective, or Alton even the Midnight Ravens. And so, so that's how it started, you know, uh, as far as this. So that was, they were my core group. As soon as I had a core group and, and I knew the whole thing, that was it. I, then, I don't know when this was, but whenever, um, remember Al Sharpton called for a day of absence? Yeah. Okay. Big Which degree. was, you know, based on Black Solidarity Day and Dr. Carlos Russell, et cetera, although we well, have, yeah, That's what you all say. It's an old other thing. When he said day of absence, because I was Negro Ensemble Company, that's a Douglas Trent Award play for yeah. day of absence. Which Carlos Russell went ahead and adapted to this concept that was, that became Black oh, Solidarity so, Day. So still came from... So, so oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Douglas, In other words... Carlos did not think it is of his own. He was familiar with the day of absence, and that's where the well, idea this is came a, this from. is interesting because I call myself a, a cultural revolutionary. Mm -hmm. I'm actually an evolutionary, but a, 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 an evolutionary that uses uh, revolutionary tactics at times, right? But because I knew the play, because I was at Negro Ensemble Company, mm -hmm. and for that day, I that's the first time I did. Day of absence. We did day of absence at the at the uh, at the station as that day was happening. It was in the middle of the day, and that was the first audio. Well, no, we did one uh, uh, like a, a couple of weeks before. I think it was called it. Uh, so something we did. The whole thing we used Brian Gumble as one of the people because well they can do different voices. And so we did day of absence. It was an amazing piece. I used the whole station. People were like amazing. What the heck's going on? I used because I'm from theater, so I used the different studios as like like, like it was just. A, a different set, a different scene in the set. So I bring up a microphone that that would be main, main control, and bring up another microphone that would be the end. And so it was really interesting, you know. And people were like amazed. Wow, is this yeah. stuff captured? You got reel to reel somewhere? This yeah, somebody has it someplace. Yeah, <laughs> it was a good piece. <laughs> somebody has. I think that creativity has it in the archives. Daryl or, or Michael, they have uh, Talk to them, find out. I mean, it would be uh, interesting to just go ahead. I mean, look, I mean, that's one of the things that we're faced with, you know, as we uh, grow older and older, the idea of documenting, of having these things available for people beyond our, our little circle or our families or something so that it can well, sure. live in posterity. Well, Melvin has a lot of stuff because what we did in that 82 when I was helping Bernard. Melvin? Yeah, Mel, Melvin Simmons. Well, when 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 eighty two when I when I started we started I started helping Bernard also by taping community forums that that that, that Lobby Brath or or Samari Marksman would be doing you know be at Harriet Tubman uh, yeah that, thank you very much every time you see some school uh, every every time you see a Lobby walking down the street he always had a fly and people would sometimes we'd be avoiding him because he <laughs> sure fly but we would take these forums but there was a lot of people coming to try to tape them and so uh, me and Melvin this just this is chaotic so and then we plus we we, we it costs us money. Because we had get, get the best uh, quality tape we could and give it to somebody like Samoa, and he would lose the tape. What the heck's going on? <laughs> so what we did, we started to make the yeah, best right. quality we could, give them the, the the copy and keep the masters so that everybody owned their own master. So, so the sound gallery became a thing where basically uh, we knew each other, so we would trust each other. So it's like a loose association. So 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 if somebody said Bernard needed a program here, we you know Mel would give it, or somebody else would give him a program like that. And so so I had been doing this for a while. And because of that, you know, again, you know, you're, you're taping people like, you know, uh, John Stockwell talking about how Patricia Mamuba is the back boot of his car, or, you know, uh, you know, uh, 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 some more, uh, not some more show, but uh, 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 Maurice Bishop would come, you know, we'd be taping him. I mean, I, I got to tape someplace at Thomas Agata, because mm -hmm. when he came here, you know, I'm shaking his head, hey, Tom, you know, because the person taping him. Mm -hmm. And I got this whole thing with my, Michael, I had a whole series with Michael Parente, Talking about all this, people think in the eighties. Okay, there's a thing called low intensity warfare, you know, and this. So the United States have been doing this for a long time. People don't understand this. I got we got all this kind of stuff. And John Negroponte, who all uh, went ahead and uh, ended up in uh, Iraq, you know, who's responsible for a lot of sectarian warfare because he went ahead and created death squads as he had done in Central America. 
That's it. Then you go ahead and you have a death squad and they come after one group and then the death squad goes after another group. And then the next thing you think is that, well, this group is after mine. So now we have all of a sudden sectarian warfare where it didn't exist previously. Well, that's this. So what, what I have been United doing, States foreign policy. Well, what I've been doing is since I've been doing my audio dramas, but they're mostly like black themed. Mm-hmm. But, but I, then I became, uh, then I did this huge one uh, uh, called, uh, not the long name, this was uh, The Outsider. It's like the script is this big. I just found it. It's like it's huge. It was like it was an eight and a half hour live audio drama. Richard no Wright again, huh? Yeah, I love Richard Wright. No commercial break. This was a feat. <laughs> this was a feat. It could have went to book, Guinness book, book, book of World Records, but I don't deal with those people. But the point is, I have been doing like Henry Duma. I do all kinds of things that were black day, but then, but I became arts director, and that was quite by fluke because. We had such disastrous things because they, when I first came to the station, they had the drama literature department and the music department and the budgetary winner. They put them both together. It was unmanageable. And so all these arts, all these arts directors came. They couldn't manage the thing. And I got so frustrated because I was, I would run my, doing my audio dramas out of the drama literature department because what people want to say, you have to have institutional support to do things. Yeah. The BAI was the institution. So what I did, I just said, well, whoever's going to become arts director, they better beat me on paper. That's all. So I just put in my resume. I forgot about it. I just wanted whoever became arts director just to be good at what mm-hmm. they do. And lo and behold, I became arts director. Now, now at this time, I was doing normal radio. I was enjoying normal radio. Normal radio was like wonderful. It's my therapy. What's normal radio? Once oh, again, for the audience. Oh, sorry. Normal radio is, is, is an initiative I did. And, and basically, it's hard to explain. But my state, uh, 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 it started on Wednesday. In fact, my first normal radio was just me. And I did, they had a Marcus Garvey exhibit at the Schomburg. And I did this whole three hours of Marcus Garvey on this exhibit, interviewing people and stuff like that, because it's stuff that I had been doing. And I put together a whole program on Marcus Garvey. Mm-hmm. And that, that was the first normal radio. But then I started, it was it's basically a mix of, of, uh, of community voices and whatever stuff and, and music just blending in to make some sort of themed program. and But eventually it grew to, I had like, I had two people doing a Mayat, you know, brother uh, brother Reggie and sister Selma doing a Mayat. I had two interns, right? I had, I had a, a, a resident historian, that would be James Small. I had a, a resident herbologist, that would be uh, Dr. Johnny Moore. I had, uh, I had, uh, uh, I had four. I had four news people that would rotate coming in. You know, it was it was amazing. I, I think the staff eventually, No More Radio had like maybe seventeen people that would come in. You know, Chris Brand would we would, Chris Brand would do a, a poetry special every once in a while. We we tape it and then send it down to Bluefields, Nicaragua. You know, those kind of things. It was an amazing thing. So I was doing No More Radio. I was having a grand time, and then then I became uh, what they call production engineer for the station. Uh, and it'd be, and that would give me a little bit of money. And I had this whole scheme that I was gonna make it so I could work like three days a week, so I could have four, all four days, and I go back to school. And you know, and, well, the whole arts director thing just knocked that thing right out. And what happened was basically, I knew I couldn't be be an administrative arts director and also do normal radio at the same time. So I just stopped doing normal radio. The only thing I did, I told people, no, I'm not gonna engineer for you. You, you know, because I, I, when I became arts director, I made all my Producers be able to engineer themselves. That's sorry. People come to my point. I said, "Can you cut, cut? Can you cut tape?" No, but brother, you know we got this revolution. I said, "No, I, I know, but can you cut tape? You know, that's all I want. You know, can you cut tape? Can can you produce on your own? You know, do you have your own microphone? Do you have your own headphones? Do you, do do you have your own gear? Basically, and a lot of people don't. They just want to go open the microphone and talk. Yep, 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 whatever. So anyway, that, that's what. It is. So Nova Radio was just an initiative I did. That, uh, that I thoroughly enjoyed, very informative, mainly somewhat arch-driven, driven, but really with a political edge to it. Mm-hmm. Now, the technology has changed. You know, you're talking about cutting tape and the rest of oh, the yes, stuff, yeah. which, <laughs> you know, as we know, we don't necessarily have to do that anymore. No, we don't. So uh, the technology has changed. How has that impacted your view of the arts and your ability to go ahead and bring uh, various messages to folks in various forms. Well, for me, it, to, believe it or not, it hasn't really changed that much. Only because, because remember, I do audio drama, and audio drama still remain basic. I mean, you, you, it's, you're 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 acting to a microphone, so you, by definition, be an audio dramatist, you have to have a microphone. So that's the only equipment I re- you really need. Now, but if that microphone leads into a digital 
you know, storage thing. That's something if it links into a tape, whatever. That's that's the only difference. The, the storage. And what's interesting, being uh, I have my, I uh, I have been working for Democracy Now. I've been doing engineering for Democracy Now. I'm the one that did the musical breaks. I'm the one with Democracy Now. When they were uh, when we got when we were at the station, and we got kicked out of the station. <laughs> We got we got cooled out of the station, and they went to the firehouse. To the firehouse. Uh, so I was the engineer that was, went through all of that. This is before they got the whole TV thing. So the whole thing. In fact, uh, I told me, we had Eminem, uh, uh, Rick Jurgens. He's the one. We, we were broadcasting at the firehouse Garrett. You know, so you can imagine like like Amy's where you are a little bit further away. I'm the engineer, right? And then um, uh, Rick comes up one time and says, "Why don't you just turn on the cameras?" I'm looking at Amy, Amy looking at me, what's your name? She said, this is a satellite studio for Eminem. If you, because this was the, all of the, the whole thing about the, the Emmy getting kicked out or, or, or Democracy Now getting kicked out because uh, uh, Juan did a principal thing and just stopped, just severed all time. So only, it was only Amy fighting and whatever have you. So what happened was, uh, 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 he said, no, these cameras are Eminem. You know, just open up the cameras, we'll, we'll tape it, we'll send it to free speech, uh, television and they'll put it, that's how the word will get out. So that's what started the whole juggernaut te television thing. So I was in that whole transition with that, the, the whole 911, all that. You can hear me. In fact, if you go to the archives, just when it's just ready, you can hear me talking because we were just that, this, that, we were interrupting. With, I heard the, the planes going over, you know, at 9 or whatever, 902, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So we had to go through all that. And, um, uh, and I, I guess really, uh, it was, it was like, for me, it was like, I don't want to say bitter. Let me put it this way. Uh, when I became arts director, I became arts director, and I, and I did all the all that stuff that I did, you know, but what really was, to me, was 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 um, the skill that I got from doing that. I just, I just want to say that because I had a little accident with the scene, so I had to stop doing democracy and everything. I, for a year, I was in a neck brace and recuperating, recuperating down at Silver Spring, Maryland, and the people at PFW down there, you know, they were doing a program. Renee Brown was doing a program, uh, uh, Earth Watch or something, not Earth Watch, whatever it was called. Um, and they wanted me to engineer because they knew of my expertise or whatever in engineering. I didn't want to do it, but I did. And, uh, and that was the first time I had to do uh, digital, you know, no, no enter. And I'm going like, this is cheating. So just to answer your question, the digital thing to me is total cheating. Because you know, if you if you're editing tape, you got the tape hanging off you, and you got to make sure your thing is splicing back together. Then all of a sudden, you get this, and you go like, "Oh man, this is." So I could I can literally I can literally take a three hour thing and, 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 and reduce it down to eight minutes in no time at all. The essence of it, because of a producer, all the, it's like you, you can't all the things that I knew I could I could apply to this thing. Yeah, so I think, but I think. Um, I don't think I know that the uh, technology makes things a little more accessible, but at the same time, it makes everybody in terms of this idea of cheating. One of the things that people don't want to do, they don't want to organize anymore. They want to use social media. You know, that is the the downfall of, uh, you know, several things that we've seen. It's, to me, it's the downfall of Black Lives Matter. I think it's going to be the downfall of this uh ADOS, ADOS, uh, 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 maybe. Leave, leave ADOS. And no, the, 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 I'm, I'm going to tell you the difference. I'm going to tell you the difference. Black Lives Matter, a bunch, every movement before can be infiltrated, okay? Black Lives Matter, at least you have to have lineage in a certain thing. And though it's a social a movement, nobody, the, 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 the leaders, you get marching orders from, from a certain thing, and they're organized in a certain way. I know this because I, 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 I viewed them from from from, this, from South Africa. I said, "Whoa, this is interesting how this is happening." And so, what happens is going to be is very difficult. It's near impossible. I call black I, I call uh, Ados bulletproof because it's impossible. First of all, you have to have lineage or skin in that game. If you're not lineage, you're not lineaged, then you know that it's difficult for you to have a voice in there. Okay, and you can have a voice as an ally, but then you're an ally. Yeah. So you, you just leave, leave them alone. Well, you don't, I mean, you, I see that as subjective. Don't care Black but, Lives Matter because Black Lives Matter wanted to be paid. They don't. They, these people are not getting about. Well, you know, I don't think they wanted to be paid. I think that uh, that yeah. was the easiest thing for uh, the, the government and forces to do is to just go ahead and pay folks off. Well, it's not so gonna whether it's going to be Soros or whether it's going to be a book deal or whatever it's going to be, you know, much of the leadership 
a so-called leadership of Black Lives Matter went ahead and you know got the yeah, contract or whatever. Media, that's what I'm saying. They're talking. See, the, 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 we're talking about when you talk about ADOS, it's about data, it's about statistics, it's about data, it's about cl clarity. And that's what makes it different. For everybody's, you know, because again, I, I, I don't believe everybody knows about ADOS. What is ADOS, just that, and then we got to get back because we got to go to South Africa, among okay. other things. Um, I was sitting in South Africa when I uh, ADOS is basically, it is the American Descendants of Chattel Slavery, Slavery the Institution. I say North American Descendants of Chattel Slavery. So it's American Descendants of Slavery. That's the acronym. But it, 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 it's basically, if you have lineage, uh, going back through all the all the machination that went from then be or everything, but from from the ramifications of slavery to antebellum to Jim Crow to you know all of the all the segregation right up and right up and through now, I guess you you would even go through prison pipeline. But but basically, if you want to, uh, uh, that's it. That, that if you have lineage in that thing, that means you have identified your group. You have identified a group that went through a certain thing. Up until now, the, the, the identification has been superficial. They're black or they're African American. These are superficial things, but but lineage just defines something. And uh, because you you were, you were shut out of certain things, this this, this group of people shut shut out of certain things. Then 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 the reparations is is due. It's not forget the money part. Is a, a wrong has been done. Reparations is due, or or, or or you need a repair. And I won't get into it. ADOS speaks for itself. You need to find out about it. Just go to ados101.com. They're having another. Uh, hopefully, I'll, I'll be there. They're having another conference uh, coming uh, next October. I think probably about the same day. So I forget what the dates are. Just go to ADOS101.com and they'll, they'll, they'll fix you with that. But I learned about them because I, in South Africa, I don't watch TV. You know, so I, would, I, I just do it. How did you get to South Africa? I mean, you're talking about in South Africa. Oh, I mean, this gosh. is now. Oh, All right. I'm an audio We're at WBAI. We do stuff. We also have to mention that aside from uh, doing some of your uh, audio, audio dramas. dramas, you've been doing other drama, working with people like David Wright, who's been, you know, he's done over the years, uh, really a, uh, a a serious series of the Orisha plays, yeah. plays that have to do with the deities as far as the Yoruba belief system goes. Yeah. I mean, an amazing series of plays, and I know you were definitely well, engaged in that. Okay, I'm trying. To, I'm gonna have to talk fast. I'll try to be as quick as possible <laughs> because I, I left. I had left. Um, I had left my job as 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 a as arts director, and I told him I was only going to do it for three years. But Samori asked me to stay basically another year, so I did it four years. But I said I got to get out of here. I'm not an administrator. I'm an artist, mm -hmm. you know. I'm an artist. What can I want you to do? I'm an audio dramatist. That's what I do, and I have been doing um, stuff all over the all over the planet. I mean, you know, I, I was part of uh, uh, AMOC, the World Association of Community Broadcasters. Every time they had a conference, every every think they had every four years, I would do a live audio drama there. And one of the times we were in um, we was in Italy in, uh, in Milan, I think we was in Italy, and um, and, um, and Zane Ibrahim from Bush Radio. Uh, Cape Town was there, and it was such an amazing. He he never seen anything like it. He said, "I gotta get you to come to Cape Town and do a workshop." And I'm going like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." You know, I went back to, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he had been calling me, bugging me for you. Then I had a little accident with the sea, but then when I was recuperating. And I was in DC, and doing and doing that that, that program. Then Vane, then they, they wanted to offer me a contract. I didn't want to work, you know, down in DC. And so, but they said, "Hey, you can, uh, you know, you got some money. You can come down to Cape Town and and do a workshop for us." I said, "Bet." Actually, a friend of mine, uh, uh, Josina Tavares, uh, Josefina, she wanted me at the same time to come to uh, the Dominican Republic and work with some kids because she knew what I, was, what I was doing. So I said, well, let, I'll do this. I'll go there and they'll give me enough money that I can travel. I can travel there. And, and since I have my little accent, I can do a little healing and travel around the world, you know, and come back, you know, like that. And so that's that was my, my objective. But it, because I was traveling so much, when I left, it, that didn't happen in 2003, right? So between 96, when I left Arts Director, I think I was traveling a lot, you know, doing audio jobs all over the place, all over the planet. And every time I would come back in, I would I, I would spend time at David's house, you know, 
and David says, "I'm working. I'm working on it." Because David knew my he was as he knew my work as audio dramatist. He had one of my workshops when I was in North Carolina. He was at a workshop. I don't remember it, but he remembers it. And he says, "I got this play. I'm working on. I want you to because he knew he knew my he knew my my theater background. Let's put it that way." And so he says, "Okay, then this was Oshun. I think yeah, this was Oshun. So he, he he shows it to me. I'm looking at it. I'm going like. You know, I'm looking at this, this is not going to work. And this is what I'm saying to myself, but I said, but yet still, I'm crashing at his place. I can't just alienate him. I'm trying to think, I'm trying to think of way they, you know, how, to, how to negotiate that. You know, yeah, that is not going to work. So that's fine. He said, well, you know, uh, you can make this, you can, you can make this like a, a, a musical. I mean, like, 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 like a dance drama. I said, a dance drama. You know what I mean? So I gave him an eye for a dance drama. And I split. <laughs> So he made it into a dance drama. So he came back, and it was a success. Then he says, "I, I, I want to work on this this next this, this piece." And so uh, on, on this dance drama, anyway, I want, I'm working on this other piece. I want to work on this other piece. I said, oh, "Okay, what you work on?" He said, "Want to do Oya?" Oh, yeah. And I said, "Oh, okay, sure. You get the script. I'll look at it." Right? So he started working. Started working. I started helping working a little bit on Oya. Oh, yeah. So he, he had a good script, right? And so. Again, I was running back. I was doing something. I left. I, I was out of the country. Came back. It was some sort of thing for. Figure is that Malik Yoba's place or something like that was like George Wolf was there, and I would clearly remember. Uh, uh, David was. It was like a, these stand up tables, and David was talking to um, uh, uh, Frank, uh, the Cafe, uh, Frank Serrano workshop uh, guy. Um, um, oh man, I forgot. Anyway, he was talking to him, and he says when he wanted to do a reading of Oya, right? I heard him in the back thing, but I was talking to somebody else. And then, 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 then so, so uh, I said, well, who is going to direct it? You know, because it, 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 Frank's where work, where his rights workshop had the strict thing that the playwrights couldn't direct their own piece. Okay. In fact, you would have to do your piece and the playwright couldn't say anything while people criticize, right? So David said, oh, he is Anthony. You know? And, oh, uh, man. And I'm going like, who? Huh? What? <laughs> and so, so that was, oh, yeah, but the thing is, I said, David, I'm not going to direct no Oya. Oh, yeah. I don't want to mess with any of this Yoruba stuff. You know, I ain't going to go come down. I ain't going to come down and yank me out of here. I've been, I've been to West Africa. I've, you know, I've, I have my encounters with my thing. You know, I've, I've, I've been to Gambia, so my third eye. I ain't messing with none of that stuff <laughs> yeah, at all. Yeah, yeah. And he said, no, no, don't worry about it. You know, I'll, you know, you just do it. I'll, I'll, you know, so and and you we know, have to tell the, the audience once again, we're talking about he mentioned Oshun and Oya, two of the female Orishas or deities in the Yoruba belief system. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so we, so, so we did a reading. How did we do this? We did a, we did a reading of Oya, and uh, all, all of the Yoruba bigwigs came to this thing, and everybody was there. And, uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I don't know what happened. No, no, no. Wait, I'm sorry. Let me go back. No, it wasn't Oya. It was still Oshun. They did a reading of Oshun. I just did the reading. You know what I mean? But I did it certain things. And so somebody picked up. Uh, I think the New York Post Cafe picked it up, and they they would did it. And I was still traveling. And I came back. He's, oh, it was a success, right? Whatever that production was, was a success. I think I did the radio part. I'm not, I'm not sure. Oh, then after I did, I did the. I don't forget that. That, that, that was what I do. No, 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 no. You know, I did, I, I did, I did, I did. Somehow, something, something happened. But then I was at David's house, and he said he wanted to do this other piece, and he wanted to do this thing. And, and Aixa, this Aixa uh, Kendrick, she was in one of this, um, was was in uh, Oshun as a minor character, right? But we, we both at the same time said Aixa for o, for Oya. As soon as we said that, he started working on the play. I helped him like that, and then. Uh, we got uh, uh, Tunde Samuels to produce it because David, oh, yeah. all, all these people, all, all these people owe David a lot of favors because he's a sound designer. Right. You know, whatever he did, all this national black theater. I have been doing a bit of a natural black. I knew about the black national black theater because I took workshops when I was in school in the seventies or whatever have you. So I knew about and all that. I know they don't remember anything about me. So David, so David brought together me as director. Tunde was the producer. You know, Barbarantia's theater, right? Then he had, he had Christophe Pierre was the lighting designer, and uh, this other guy was a, was a set designer. But what happened was nobody knew who I was. Nobody knew my theater background. And so David was trying to explain. And didn't, Tunde didn't know my theater background either. So when I was first rehearsals, Tunde came to the thing, and he saw what was going on. Because I, 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 I direct a certain way. 
it's, it's weird. But when I'm doing audio drama, I'm, I'm different. But when I'm a theater director, I'm a, I'm, one of, I'm a typical, I'm an eight, I'm, I'm a tyrant. I'm a real theater person, <laughs> right? And so, but Tunde saw it, and what he did was so brilliant because he's producing. He made Barbara and Tia stay away because Barbara, you know, Barbara's Barbara, you know. Let's put it this way. I'm a, I'm a child of Ogun. Barbara's a child of Shango. It wasn't going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. So two they did brilliant thing. Well, we went through this process and it was, as it was the way I do it. It's just, you know, you, you, you have to be on your toes. We went through da 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 da, da. And when, by the time we was about to, the set was amazing. We, I mean, you know, and I have a certain way, even when I'm, even when I'm casting, what I do is I don't, I say, look, look, there's a playwright, there's a producer, the director, right? I just say, here's what I would like, you all figure it out. <laughs> and whoever you give me, I mean, I'll, I'll work with them. So we, we did this piece. This piece was so powerful that people were, for Barbara, uh, for people were calling. Barbara said it was the first time in her life that people were calling her at home to try to get tickets to get into this thing. It was an amazing production. It was up. It, it got all these deco things, you know, accolades. But they wouldn't give. They wouldn't list. They wouldn't give David the writing. They wouldn't. Uh, uh, I, it's, it's a whole political thing with deco. Really. So we all. Everybody got nominated. I think the dance person and me were the only ones that didn't win out of the six out of the six things like that. And David said, "No, that's not fair." I said, "No, that's good because the next time, you know, I me mean, then we have something to strive for." You know, I don't want awards anyway. But two day two day passes, so that, that was the end of that. That was yeah. that was that was, it, that was, it yeah. was terrible, man. It was terrible because. And then David kept on with the plays. Yeah, he continues yeah. on with the plays. Yeah, so I kept on helping various him. places just, or whatever yeah. over the years, and they're they're great works. You know, David. Uh, Really great works. Listen, man, we got to talk about South Africa in five minutes now. No, no worries. Uh, so when I came to South Africa, I, I, I gave them a workshop. They wanted to give me a, like a whatever ten days. I gave a three month workshop um, in audio drama, and then I just started to do audio drama there. And I started to uh, I got a grant here. I got a grant there. I would go out to the to the townships and, and, and do little workshops. I developed this whole thing. It's all on my. If you go to my static website, uh, 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 what is it? www.ajsloan.name and you go to Cape Town, you'll see the, the whole workshop. It's all laid out there. Then my whole thing. If you actually you just Google me somehow, you know, AJSloan.name. That name, yeah. I wanted an early believe I, I I I I did I do I'm unusual, you know what I mean? Um so uh uh yeah dot name. www.ajsloan.name uh, uh, and you'll, you'll, you'll see it's a static website just sort of like a history like that but I ended up doing it even got we, I, I was uh, 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 attached to this uh, thing called Adasa uh, this is an uh, NGO and it was the first time in their 20 year career they got a, 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 a grant for, from the lottery fund which is the biggest thing in South Africa you know what I mean because uh, I won't get into details there's other places but so I did. Plus, I was teaching at University of Cape Town. I do. I did workshop at Rhodes University and audio. All the audio drama. Some of the stuff. I think the audio Rhodes one is on on uh, the Altered Boy. It's on. It's online. If you go to if you go to my if you go to my web my uh, YouTube page, Anthony J Sloan, YouTube page, Anthony J Sloan. And just just go subscribe. You know what I mean. You know don't you notify whatever. It's not monetized. There's no thing involved, and it's creative comments, so you can do whatever you want. And you have a, a thing where I'm doing, where I do these rants, you know, well, these these commentaries. <laughs> I do these commentaries, I should say. And, but I also have a, a, the thing is more. I have a playlist that's, that's interviews. The interviews are really amazing. Then you are you are one of the interviews or, or anything like that, like that. Um, so 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 that's that's there, and uh, you know, it, it, I just go on. It, I have a whole ADOS thing, how I, you can see my journey through ADOS and the understanding of it. Um, uh, but then I just keep on going. But I want to say something about, about the whole YouTube thing. And maybe you should be doing this too. Like a lot of people, we should be doing this. The reason why I started my, my uh, commentaries was just to sort of give memoir to my life, right? But now with, with the software and everything, yeah, I can take any one of those commentaries, all of those commentaries, and I can change them from audio to text and then edit the text. So I basically have a living... I have living commentary, so I encourage everybody. I know YouTube. Uh, if you want to make money on YouTube, that's your, that's all you. But there should be some place that you're re recording this in a real way, especially the old heads, man. Don't don't, don't say, "Well, I got to look good. I got to do this." And that. Ah, forget that. Just start talking. <laughs> Just start talking. You'll sell into it. You know.
So listen, Anthony, now you spend time between North America and South Africa. You're married to a South African woman. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. And I, I, li- I live in a village, actually. I, li- I live in a place called Nabete, uh, Salamanzi Township, uh, by Alice. Uh, and I work uh, and I work with a, a, a people at a place called Dembaza. And I'm uh, seeing, the movie Last Graves at yeah, Dembaza, yeah. man. Something that we showed back in the early 1970s. Yeah. And as far as uh, that, uh, you know, our engagement with the liberation struggle in South Africa. And when I say us, East Organization in Brooklyn, African Liberation Support Committee, one of the uh, most important times when Africans from throughout the diaspora cooperated and gave material support, political support, all kinds of support, propaganda support to the African liberation movements, making sure that Africa would be free. And now... Well, you know, Africa's still not free. <laughs> uh, but, but I, 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 look, I, w- I wouldn't worry about that right now. I mean, I mean, people should stay on that, stay on that square, do what they need to do, because the mean age for Africans are under thirty years old. They're young people. Young people are not taking it anymore. I'm telling you right now. I work with young people right now. I'm senior advisor to a radio station called Kasi to Kasi, Kasi to Kasi, like the letter two. I mean, the number two. And these are young people, and they're not taking it. You know, in fact. Um, one of the things I encourage people to do is to find to find your 22 year old self, your 25 year old self, and, and and just encourage them. You don't have to. I don't, I don't say mentor. Just the, the, as an elder, what we're supposed to be doing is just sit back. Somebody comes to you for advice, you give them advice. They don't take your advice, fine. They do take your advice. That's what it is. But you don't be forcing your thing. You're still not out there trying to be you know, the the warrior that you was at 30 years old. Come on now, that don't make no sense. Go someplace, whittle your rocking chair, sit down a rock. You know what I mean? I, I can't. And what upsets me is all these old people still trying to be in the spotlight. Find your thirty year old self. Find your thirty five year old self. There's a guy, Juice Malema, and uh, who has an EFF. He he said this something very very interesting. Everybody's talking about they want a united Africa, whatever. All he said, the first thing I do, collapse the borders. That's, after you collapse the borders, then you can do your Pan African thing. You can do whatever you want, but just collapse the borders. That's the first thing you do, and and, and we all get uh, visa free, uh, rather uh, fee free visas, and you can go and do business in South Africa on a lower level. You don't have to be no big country, to, you know, corrupting the leaders or whatever have you. That's my vision. My vision right now. That's what I'm working for. My work for is, is to make sure that we can be any place in Africa. Yes, from Morocco all the way down to you know to Malawi, whatever. And I mean the sixth region. I mean since the African Union says that the diaspora is the sixth region, we have to go ahead and make that operational so that we have a real structural, political, concrete relationship to the African Union. Because uh, African Union, Africa needs us just as much as we need Africa, if not more. Uh, you know, all the children in the diaspora are, I mean, it's an essential part of what Africa is. So we got to do that. And for the old people, we just can't sit in a rocking chair. We have work to do. Yeah, you and do that work, work is yeah. in terms of documenting Thank you. and uh, capturing, I guess we have to say, some of that history. Which True. we were talking about. That's what I'm saying. Day. All I'm saying, my problem is that I find old people is getting in the way, not allowing the young people to do what they're supposed to do. Okay? I mean, that, to me, uh, I'm sorry to get back. Let me get back to Ados. You know, to me, there's two young people that's, did, that's really the, the, the what I call the, the engines for this. And, and I follow their marching orders. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I think they're wrong sometimes, or right sometimes, but I don't care. You know what I mean? Because I'm doing something else. I'm doing something else. I'm doing something else. I'm actually doing something else. They can handle it. You know what I mean? When I was their age, I could handle it too. When you was their age, you could handle it too. Why do why do you, why do people think that 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 that, that no? I'm sorry. I, I just don't go for this. You know what I mean? So that's that's my whole spiel. Sorry to talk so fast and so long, but you ah, know, this is me. I blah blah. It's blah. not too fast and it's not too long because we only had you know 58, 59 minutes to go ahead and get everything in. And I think I guess we did it. Oh, good. Pretty pretty decent job <laughs> based yeah. upon the limited time that we yeah. had. But hey, you know. Sacred expressions. That's right. That's what we've been doing. On the air. Yeah. And you are? Anthony J. Sloan. And the J stands for justice. No, it stands for John. But the J stands for justice. <laughs> A.K.A. T 
from the Pattersons taking a train to Tibet, letting you know what I only suspect. When are you headed back to South Africa? Saturday. <laughs> you and you're going to be in South Africa for how long? Uh, I, 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 I should be back here like the end of April, beginning of May, somewhere around there. And then I'll be here for like six months until the ADOS conference in October. Right. This, this so you'll be doing like six months here, six months there. Yeah, six, yeah. But I have a lot of work to do here and there. But here I'm going to do a lot of... Uh, some of my plays. You do a lot of traveling. That's, I mean, the main thing is like you've been going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Yeah, whatever here, I'm usually. Between the a Chinese time. bus and Amtrak. It's yeah. like, you know, it's a whole thing. Yeah, I'm, I, you know, I'm in Virginia, I'm in here, and I'm in St. Louis. Like that. Yeah. St. Louis, I've been hanging out at the Eugene Remens uh, Writers Club. Okay. I like that. Cool, cool, cool. Hey, and I'm Basir M. Chowie. Uh, many of you know me from WBAI, but obviously there's a a uh, much longer, longer, deeper history than that, which I guess I got to capture some of that myself. You know, we just had the 50th anniversary of the East. Uh, back in May of this year, we had a celebration in Brooklyn. See, somebody needs to be interviewing you. I'm telling you, man, the whole thing. Robin F. Williams, come on. Well, listen, brother, I, you know, I got to do that stuff. And uh, first radio program, which was on WLIB, I interviewed Robin Williams. And Amiri Baraka and Alice Cole. I mean, so many folks, man. It's like, yeah, all the, wow. All the, all the cultural things that you've been through, man. And the East is like legendary. It is. It and is. a lot of people it don't is. know no, nothing about no East. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. The East is as significant as, as Soul yeah, on TV. Yeah, to me, East and Soul were, 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 were like were two, two things, whatever. You know, never, I'm, I'm yeah, well, you know listen, they got, the Ellis, they got the Ellis Hayes Lip documentary, which I haven't seen yet, but. Listen, you know, we need that East documentary. And That's we've got saying. we've got a number of um, filmmakers. We've got some award winning f- winning filmmakers who've come out of the East. Children, East children, East chilling. And uh, maybe that'll happen. We'll see. Time yeah. will tell. All right. Well, this has been Sacred Exces- Expressions. <laughs> My name is Basir Mchawi. And we'll be back with you really soon. Appreciate it. Peace. Yeah. Well, they the didn't reset the what, clock. The time, what that, time? Went, that went over that, that one. Was, that, 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 was that, that clock, the clock wasn't that, on. That wasn't on. We didn't no. know what time it was. No. no. The clock wasn't on. I had to look at my time? watch. What's the time with it? We did one something. You did one hour. One hour, oh, five then, minutes.